Hello, my name is Ashley Coffey, and I'm the Director of Technology and Integration at Exalter, as well as a member of the XR Access Business Case XR Working Group. And I am delighted to moderate this XR Access panel on Building for All. We have a wonderful combination of perspectives to share from our panelists today. I'll ask each of them briefly to introduce themselves and share what they focus on in regards to building XR experiences for all. We will start with Mari Kyle of Facebook Oculus. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mari Kyle and I'm a game producer at Facebook Oculus. Uh, I work with a team of producers to create many of our first party games, as well as build resources and solutions for all of our developers. At Oculus, I led an initiative to create a set of virtual reality recommendations uh, standards across Rift and Quest platforms for accessibility features and also built a series of educational resources for our developers. These resources include a video walkthrough of accessible design in VR and a thorough set of developer documentation that provides detailed tips and best practices for accessible VR. Excellent, thank you. Andrew, would you briefly introduce yourself? Hi, yes, uh, thank you. I'm Andrew Ike. I'm the CO Owl and Cable Slinger at Alchemy Labs. Uh, we are a XR studio building uh, innovative and exciting all ages experiences. Um, we're well known for the game's job simulator, uh, vacation simulator, including our recent add-on back to job and uh, Rick and Morty virtual reality. Um, one of the big things that we do is uh, our, our kind of, you know, mission statement is VR for everyone or XR for everyone because we've now pushed forward. And, you know, we believe that in kind of all aspects of XR for everyone. So, you know, this talk today is going to touch on, I'm sure, a lot of that and kind of our philosophies behind that. And accessibility is a big part of that philosophy. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll hear from Roland Dubois. Roland? Thank you so much for having me. My name is Roland Dubois. I'm adjunct faculty teacher for immersive design at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I'm also the creator of webxrnews.com, a newsletter that focuses around webxr in the general sense, what's out there in the industry. Um, I am hosting webxr um, New York City and AFRIM New York City as workshops and meetups, um, allowing people to play around with the uh, immersive tech. And um, I'm also um, working um, uh, on accessible projects and prototypes in diverse uh, um, hackathons uh, um, wherever I can uh, in collaboration with uh, Thomas Logan from Eco Entry. Thank you. And our fourth panelist is Sophia Mosasha, VP of the VR AR Association DC chapter. Sophia, would you tell us a little bit more about you and your work? Absolutely. Thank you for having me again, Ashley. And it's very nice to, to be on this panel with everyone that has um, such focused goals on XR accessibility, because that's precisely what we need in our industry. Um, as you said, Ashley, I am the VP of the DC chapter of the VR AR Association. Uh, I also co-founded a group called XR Women, which is how I delightfully met you, Ashley. And then um, I co-produce events surrounding WebXR, um, including the WebXR Awards and the WebXR Developer Summit. So all of these initiatives and efforts are focused around education, uh, awareness, and accessibility for um, XR and uh, the industry at large and, and getting people to understand what we can do with the technology and how to deploy it to the masses. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here today and being a part of this important discussion and this important work. We have a lot of exciting topics to dive into today. So with all of your fascinating blends of backgrounds here, I'd like for each of you to share perspectives on how important it is to build XR experiences for all, especially at the beginning of content development and design not just along the lines of designing for disabilities, but in the broader sense of being inclusive of all underrepresented or marginalized groups. Unless we do this, we will not have equity in XR design, usage, experiences, and opportunity. Marie, would you share your thoughts first? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, we see far too often that developers often think of designing for accessibility or building more inclusive games and applications as kind of an afterthought rather than as a central part of their application. 
Um, but given how immersive and personal VR experiences can be, where you're actually living and experiencing these applications firsthand, uh, we have an immense responsibility to make sure that these applications implement inclusive considerations at the start and integrate them into all aspects of development, from mechanics to UI to sound, art, and more. Uh, often, when building for broader inclusion, you end up making the application more comfortable for all audiences. The phenomena of the curb cut effect feels even more real in VR, where so many people are still learning how to locomote and interact and just simply live within these worlds. Thank you, Marie. I'd love to hear thoughts from the other panelists as well. I'll just step in and say something really quick. In terms of building for all diversity and, and, and inclusion, I think it's generally... Uh, very important to get the perspectives of people from a very diverse background because if we don't we're missing out on a lot of great content that could apply both to these niche groups and underrepresented groups as well to the ma as to the masses and when i mean diversity i also mean um, diversity in subject matter expertise because you can be a great designer and developer but without partnering with people that have this deep industry knowledge, we're not going to be able to execute XR at its its greatest capacity. So I definitely think that it's important to include people from a variety of backgrounds when developing um, XR experiences. Sophia, that was almost like the perfect tee up for something that I was about to say, which is um, one of the things that we do at Alchemy, right? Because Because we're more focused on kind of our specific thing, not the not the broader like organizational stuff is you know we work really hard to make sure that our our products are you know back to that vr for all are kind of under that banner and so kind of one of the things i want to point out as an example for folks is we built this character creator at alchemy right and it's for the vacation simulator game and we really wanted to make sure that everyone could be their truest selves so you know we contracted with the group pretty brown and nerdy to make sure that we represented black uh, hairstyles properly. We brought in Google's diversity and inclusion group to do testing and give us feedback. We brought in other P other folks who were part of different religious communities that had religious headwear to make sure that we represented all that correctly. And it was a massive amount of work, but in the end, you know, I, I feel like we have one of the it's a very select group of games that have, you know, this kind of broad spectrum representation where you can really make yourself. And that's really meant a lot to folks. And some of the other things too, is like, there's a lot of subtle things you can do, a lot of things that you can think about, right? So um, something that very few people have noticed, uh, but it exists is the, in our game, all the characters are genderless and we use the non-gendered they. They're robots, right? That's what we decided. We did it, we committed to it, and we've never actually heard anyone say anything, which is kind of cool, right? Everybody just accepted that as as the base. And then all of that kind of knowledge carries into our work on accessibility. So, you know, it's really important that we brought these folks in at the very beginning and then had them reviewing our content throughout, right? We were sending mock-ups of different hairstyles like fades out to Pretty Brown and Nerdy, and they were making comments and sending it back to us to make sure that, you know, even if you might not necessarily have the diverse set of talent in your company it's worth going out and hiring you know contract groups and bringing those folks in to make sure that that you can increase that diversity you have access to i was gonna say andrew i noticed whenever alchemy came out with that i i realized that you did put a lot of groundwork into that and i attributed that back to 2019 xr access when you were sitting at the table trying to understand how to pull these resources together and bring them to the forefront at alchemy labs to actually implement in your design so bravo to you and your team for doing the groundwork that's it truly doesn't go unnoticed well thank you yeah i, I just um i wanted to uh speak about the actual content that we are always touching on right because we have to think about xr as a medium of delivery of content and uh, the diversity aspect and the equity aspect is uh, how do I consume that content? How do I make that content usable and useful for the people that you're actually targeting? And uh, um, how do we make it more inclusive, right? So what, what Andrew did uh, was really interesting in the gaming space to actually have representation of the same um, like, uh, user groups. And so they have the reflection of themselves in that content. But when it comes down to content for usability and productivity, and we have to think about how do actual people consume and ma navigate that content based on their uh, their abilities, their um, cognitive uh, um, like 
patterns that they're used to, their cultural references, and all this other stuff. So it's um, when I teach at SVA, my students I always uh, start very basic at what is the actual content you want to deliver, and then how do you actually make that work in that medium, and what kind of parallel worlds can you create that provide the same kind of quality of experience in all the different kind of layers of XR. So that's that's really important. Focus and center is always content first, and then then the technology and the limitations around it. Sophia, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I completely agree with what everybody else is saying. I think it's super important to get all perspectives on board and, and because you can't create for a demographic or a culture or anybody really without getting the perspectives of the people that you're creating for. So I think in, in terms of um, diversity and inclusion and, and accessibility, I would say you both have to think about the creation and development side of things as well as um, the audience and deployment and, and how you're going to get your, your content out to um, your target audience. And then you also have to think about uh, about how you're going to deploy it as well, because one solution may not be the, the one size one size fits all solution for for all audiences. So you have to understand who you're trying to target and how they're going to be able to access uh, uh, um, uh, access uh, XR content and understand what medium might be the best fit for that audience, um, which is why I love the upcoming developments of, of WebXR and the capabilities that that brings to accessibility. Absolutely. Great, great perspectives here. And one key thing that I think is a great takeaway, especially for our audience, is awareness matters. So talk about these things at the companies that you work for, or work with, um, kind of spread that word because the more that we're working with one another and spreading the awareness of the importance of this access, then the more that it can take spread and take flight and actually be implemented from the ground up and not as an afterthought. As we've discussed this imperative for building XR experiences for all, I'd like to discuss how we go about actually doing it. It strikes me as key to have approaches, resources, as well as people who can learn about and practice building XR experiences for all. In terms of resources and processes, what are your thoughts here? I can uh, I can jump in here. Uh, my biggest tip for developers and uh, people who are trying to build ex uh, accessible experiences is really to try going through your experience or your game with different settings. So if you're an able-bodied developer, it's really hard for you to understand what it's like for people to go through your VR application without certain abilities and get a grasp for your blind spot without experiencing your application from a different perspective yourself. Uh, I usually recommend going through your game or application with certain settings like disabling all audio or playing exclusively from a seated position or desaturating your visuals and seeing if you can navigate your VR application with these settings. So for example, if a, a puzzle that was previously solvable by matching certain colors is now not unsolvable whenever everything's in grayscale, then you have a learning to, to bring in contrast or to bring in some sort of patterns. Or for another example, if you can't understand anything that happened in your narrative without audio, then that's another learning to add in better captioning systems or to provide some visual context cues to help users understand. Um, but to Sophia's point, sometimes, you know, it, although this works sometimes for people who are able-bodied uh, able developers who are kind of going through this experience of developing on their own, you should always get in the perspective of someone from the community to come in and play these experiences because they're always going to have the most authentic lived experience that they can share with you and be able to provide feedback. If I could add on to that, I think that's all amazing. That's like the perfect advice. I'll tell you some tricks that we use at Alchemy were uh, to help that process, right? Because it's it's easy to remember, to or it's easy to, to turn those settings on and off, but you have to remember to do it. So some of the things that we do to kind of just push that along is we built a few simple tools 
uh, to help us, right? And they're kind of silly, but really effective tools. One is the word scrambler and the other is the audio scrambler. And those are tools that actually go in and purposefully scramble all the voiceover. Uh, so, and then another tool that purposefully goes in and finds any instance of text and scrambles up the words. And the point of that testing is exactly what we've been talking about, right? It's make sure that, you know, the, <laughs> that, that you can play the game, right? And we do all that till we run out of, we run out of, you know, kind of headroom when we've stopped finding things and then we bring in folks from the community. But I want to say you can also build tools to make it easy for your developers. And if you integrate that into your testing process where you're like, as one of the tests you must do, you must turn on the word scrambler and pass it. And that's part of your definition of done. Then um, you're going to be designing things more accessible out the gate and probably more universally accessible because you're going to have to learn how not to rely on those features. So in terms of tools and resources, uh, first of all, XR Woman, we meet every Wednesday in Ireland's Verbella campus. So we have a whole slew of perspectives from the women community in, uh, in immersive technology. So I, that's a good resource there in itself. Um, there's, it, and then in terms of accessibility for on the creator side and, and there's a lot of low code, no code uh, tools and platforms out there for the no, more of the non-technical creator. And again, I think from a, a creator side, accessibility is is important as well. Um, so uh, I know Metaverse is one tool that's out there and there's, there's a few others that are great uh, for people that are just learning how to develop. And then I'll also say again, WebXR is a great new up and coming medium where you can access 3D content uh, on the web. And ch so check out what the W3C is doing with the Immersive Web Working Group and the WebXR device API that they are coming out with soon. So those are some resources to check out. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the WebXR space, um, but I just wanted to uh, point out that a very, it's very uh, important uh, what Andrew said about uh, building accessibility testing into the QI at QA pipeline. Uh, internationalization for, for, for text is nothing else than scrambling words. I think there is not too much of a leap in order to bring in accessibility and actually the, the, uh, the those tests into already established pipelines when you create uh, international software. Um, for I, um, when, when my workshops are in A-Frame, uh, which is a uh, framework that's built on top of 3JS, a JavaScript library that uses the WebXR API. Um, my students, uh, they're not tech uh, students uh, at SVA. They're mostly artists, mostly creatives. Some have JavaScript uh, knowledge, not many. Um, um, some, some people use Unity in order to build VR right away from the get-go. I always uh, stay away from that. I want to have people think about it in a st uh, con content structure way like we are used to in the, in the World Wide Web. Uh, there's so much uh, that the W3C has done uh, towards web accessibility guidelines, WCAG 2.0, 2.1, AA, AAA certifications. Um, there's so much that the, uh, the browser software already provides us with already established guidelines and tests and uh, resources that it's just a natural kind of transition to go from a um, three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional website into a three-dimensional website, and then e eventually wrapping it around yourself. Um, so, so for for that for that uh, uh, reason, I think that um, like prototyping, especially in A-frame, um, understanding space, designing for space, proprioception, space that you take yourself on inside of a virtual environment. Does it do, do things and crouch on you, or do you have enough space to breathe? Uh, does it? Do, are people in your face or do you, do you, are they too far away? So you have the feeling you cannot really interact with them. All this kind of learning experience of spatial design is much more closer to an architecture project than actually a game or a, a 2D, 2D project. So therefore tools that are free, like A-Frame is an open source project that was started by Mozilla a few years back. Um, and Babylon JS, uh, and, and there's tons of uh, JavaScript frameworks that uh, take advantage of the WebXR device API to deliver content through the browser, and you can prototype with that. That gives you a lot of opportunity to test and play without being a, an engineer, uh, just really to craft things really quickly and fast. So. 
Thank you, Roland. And thank you all for sharing great ideas about useful approaches, resources, and tools. Next, I'd like to ask each of you about the most important part of building XR for all. How can we get more people with disabilities and intersectional identities involved in XR technology, platform, and content design, ensuring that people with a lived experience of disability are driving design and improving the access and experiences available to all? What is the broader value of that? Sophia, I'd love to hear from you. I would say the broad value of developing for disabilities is you know, we have new opportunities to deliver content to people, to the masses. And if we think of XR as a new medium of communication, um, then, you know, this is, it's, it's like the new TV, the new radio of, of, um, of the 21st century. So, you know, this really, in that sense, it really does belong to the masses and to the global economy. So, and this is an opportunity to deliver content, meaningful content to those who wouldn't inherently be able to access, um, access these lived experiences. And 3D, XR, VR, AR is the closest thing that you can get to, to having those lived experiences. And I think in that sense, it is super valuable and important to uh, to be able to develop for the people that are currently missing out on these th these day-to-day -day activities in life um, and these learning experiences that are offered to to everyone else in traditional classroom environments. So it's 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 a new opportunity for everyone, but specifically for people with disabilities, um, we could offer them um, a lot of value that they currently do not get from from traditional mediums. Yeah, I'd like to give a huge plus one to Sophia's point. I think that's the thing that's most exciting about it to me is that we have a real opportunity here to kind of, you know, tear out the roots and, and restructure the standards for accessibility in this new medium in a way that we couldn't for for TV and and for you know other other media that's existed for for decades and has been developing for decades. You know, we're at the start now where we can take all these learnings and really you know create a, a solid language for us all to move forward with with accessible design. Um, as part of you know what we what we did at Oculus was we created a set of accessibility VRCs, which are like virtual reality checks that every single application has to pass or uh, is recommended to pass before they get published. And those were things like you have to have captioning, you have to have locomotion options, you have to have certain uh, things within your games. Uh, and and building this you know standard so early on is something that I think is really really exciting and just really really a good force i think to move forward with in the vr industry in terms for broadening uh the you know the the amount of developers and diversity with our developers i feel like it's really what roland mentioned in his last answer which was breaking down those barriers and making it more accessible for people who don't have coding backgrounds or years of game industry experience to come in here and build these applications and get their perspective into you know the content that they want to consume and create um, but I also feel like there's also a huge responsibility on us, like platforms, uh, to create solutions as well, because people aren't going to want to create diverse content for a platform that they can't use, you know? So it's on us to create accessible hardware, accessible solutions, and it's also uh, on, on the developers to, to create, you know, break down these barriers and make it easier for other folks to get into this industry and, and start contributing. To, to kind of even push that a little bit further, right? To talk to some of the developers that are existing, right? Cause there's, there's, you know, there's definitely a lot of these barriers being broken. And you can look at things like Rec Room and, you know, um, Dreams as examples of platforms that exist that have literally no coding experience. But I think some of the things that our developers that are already doing the work have to do is um, go out and find these people, right? You have to not be afraid to play test your games and you have to not be afraid to play test your games with an incredibly diverse set of people. Uh, it and you have to do it early, right? At Alchemy, we start playtesting our games incredibly early. We we get the smallest chunk of it we can get playtestable, and we work from there. And then we continually do it throughout, and we do it with incredibly diverse playtesters. And we've even figured out how to do it during the pandemic. You can do this, right? This is possible. <laughs> there are things like NDAs; they work, 
right? You don't have to have things leak out. You need to find your target population. Whether Even if you're doing client work, right? Go to your client, figure out what their target population is, get them to start doing play tests. Um, so yeah, and then as uh, Mari said, I love the VRCs, right? And I think our one thing at Alchemy, if I can push something here is like, make them required. They're only <laughs> optional right now. We want them to be required. It's actually a rule. So at uh, Facebook Reality Labs, we have this guideline that's never surprise users. And we consider developers to be a part of that. So if we just suddenly launched, you know, these nine VRCs that everybody had to develop these features in like a day and they had to be required, it was it would be a mess and we would get a ton of developer pushback. So we decided to use them as a runway. So we're making uh, we're making them required for, you know, for now. And then listening to the, the community, seeing which ones, um, you know, people are having difficulty with building resources around those ones. So we built those developer documentation, the video tutorials, and then kind of getting that feedback to understand, you know, what things can we as Oculus develop on our side? So like captioning solutions is something that Oculus can take on, you know, other things are things that Oculus can take on to take that load off of developers. And then what things can we create education so developers can learn to use this before we just kind of ban hammer, you know, make it required for them. Uh, otherwise they don't get to ship. Um, so we're really trying to be conscientious of uh, how developers are growing with us and how we can kind of take the load off of developers while also creating some sort of consistency for our users as well who are going to be needing these accessibility features. So I totally hear you. I am trying to get them required. Just it'll take some time to listen to the community and get an idea for what they what you know what's needed and what's not. <laughs> and 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 I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I actually think that's a fantastic <laughs> answer. And even as a developer, I'm really excited to hear about all of those things that you just talked about. So that's awesome. Yeah, there are some solutions coming. So it'll it'll hopefully be a lot easier. <laughs> I, I need to point out that Andrew with his work has been head spearing the entire space. So, <laughs> so it's a uh, really exciting, uh, what, what I've seen, uh, him publish. And, um, I, I wanted to talk about the, 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 the engineers and the de developers that are building VR experiences. The, 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 the problem that I'm seeing, the reason why, it, um, it, it's a little, uh, slow in adaptation is exposure. Uh, a lot of um, academies that train engineers and developers, they don't spend enough time on accessibility. They just uh, focus on the ever-changing landscape of frameworks. Uh, when you think about web development, the JavaScript frameworks, uh, it, it's like a moving target. So you don't, you, you basically uh, are hustling to get uh, um, into one of those ecosystems and then you're uh, blocked um, uh, from from actually learning the basics about accessibility and ADA compliance. You know, software that's not ADA compliant can sometimes not be sold. You know, educational software has to be ADA compliant, has to be accessible. Uh, and if VR software is not ADA compliant, AKA does not uh, co uh, commit to the VCAC 2.0 uh, standards, uh, then you cannot actually sell that product. You can sell the software. So it's not only an exposure and the knowledge and a good faith thing or an inclusion or a moral thing. It's also a, to a large degree a legal thing to actually build this stuff into your software in order to make sure you cater to everyone. Absolutely. I know we could talk hours about this. I, for one, could spend days talking about this. Um, we'll have to continue our critical conversations in our work streams. But Andrew, Marie, Roland, Mo Sophia, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this discussion and to share your valuable perspectives. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that all of you are a part of this conversation. And um, thank you all for this fantastic panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, oh, to all of our fantastic panelists, uh, Ashley, Mari, um, Andrew, Roland, and Sophia. Um, so our first question actually builds on something that uh, Sophia mentioned, which is low code, no code methods for development. Um, I'd love to hear responses from all of you. I know uh, Sophia is not able to make it for this Q&A. Um, so I'll hand this one to Ashley first. Uh, our, this question com comes from Krishna on Slack. Um, a lot of times accessibility that's built into XR technology relies on pretty advanced hardware. What are the challenges associated with bringing accessibility to cheaper hardware um, with fewer features that can be leveraged? Software, hardware and where we are uh, in a technological society 
I do think there are a lot of challenges that could be approached to help fix that in the long run. But with the low code, no code options that are available, and I know Roland can and really talk more about this, but with um, A-Frame and WebXR, there's a lot of opportunities for individuals to get involved in those development processes from the ground level. And I think that opens up opportunity for, for more insight into that development. I know that's not a very in-depth answer, but I do feel like Roland might have a little bit of a, a better color for that. I, um, yeah, so this is Roland. <laughs> Thanks for leading me um, in, into this discussion. Um, so like no code, low code environments, we, we've seen so much development in the web space. Um, if you think about like in the very beginning, the, uh, the, the, the software that's being used to create websites from Dreamweaver up to now, like these, um, these platforms like WordPress, right? Uh, a lot of the, the, the way content is being created on those platforms has the standardized uh, ADA and uh, um, accessibility compliance built in. So um, we, we are in the very early beginnings of those um, 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 uh, frameworks right now. Like there's Play Canvas, there's, there's uh, WebXR Engine. There's a bunch of uh, software um, out there to create WebXR uh, experiences um, with very little code or um, almost no code, just plug and play. And, and Unity is, uh, is also an example, and you can export WebXR from Unity. Um, but um, so we're, we're definitely going to see more and more uh, a structured content that is uh, ba uh, that's basically uh, set up for accessibility. Um, and, and hopefully uh, with getting some standards um, um, normalized, we, we can actually like help people to make a content structured and accessible from the get go without having to rely on the hardware um, um, to, to be able to read it just, to, you know, to, the content is the, the first part that needs to be accessible and then the hardware can read it out. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to send this second question to Marie um, on, uh, let's see, uh, James on Slack asks, are there any thought, do you have any thoughts on um, what should be the responsibility of individual developers uh, versus platforms regarding accessibility options um, within applications? Uh, that's a really great question and one that I, I think about quite a bit. Um, this is Maddie, and you know, in my past, I actually used to be an indie developer, and that was before I came to Oculus. So I have a lot of experience with, you know, searching through the tools and, and the plugins that platforms offered, and, and trying to put them into my game. And uh, the kind of the way that I've been thinking of it is, if you have needs for your game or your application that are very specific to to what you're trying to accomplish with your game, then you know maybe that's something where it, it's your responsibility to go through and research and. And try to find resources and and try to solve the problem that you're trying to solve within your experience in a way that only you can uniquely solve. But if there are things like you know captions or perhaps like locomotion uh, techniques or you know height measuring things like that that could apply across all applications, I think those are things that platforms should take on, um, and that's something that I'm really advocating for internally. Um, so yeah, things that could apply to all applications and are kind of universal, I think, should should be platforms responsibilities or even should be the responsibilities of you know game engines to offer. Um, but uh, things that uh, that are uh, sorry, <laughs> things that are within um, things that are specific to your game, I think, are things that you should focus on. Great, so great. Um, awesome. Next question is um, from, oh, sorry, scrolling through, um, from Deb on Slack. I'm going to ask actually ask all of you to comment on this one. Um, what guidelines do you follow for developing accessible content? Um, and do you have a favorite code snippet or maybe a course that you would recommend to people who are looking into making, uh, doing more accessible development? I'll take that one first. So for the developers that I work with, I reference the chapter six on accessibility guidelines that was actually put together by the XR Access organization. This is a very comprehensive document that's actually available. 
If you go to the XR Access website, it's under resources. This is a document that has been put together by a lot of amazing people um, that have been working on this since, I don't know, 2017, 2018. Um, I use that because that is the most thorough document that I have found that actually demonstrates how to build those accessible, accessible experiences, not only from um, um, a mobility perspective, but also a cognitive perspective as well. And I think that's something that we, we all need to remember whenever we're developing those experiences. Whenever I started diving into where are these guidelines for accessibility, I looked at WCAG standards. I looked at what are the accessibility standards that are already existing for the web and how are they paralleling to XR? So um, for, for that, the chapter six on the developer guide available on the XR Access website is like my Bible that I, I share with my developers. Um, but I'd be interested to hear uh, what Marie and, and Roland use as well. Uh, I can hop in. Uh, for Oculus, we actually build a, a set of guidelines uh, on accessibility and, and kind of um, a set of documents that talk about how to design accessible VR experiences, uh, as well as a video tutorial. So if you, um, I can provide the link in the Slack, but if you go to that, uh, the link on the Oculus developer dashboard, there is a set of uh, uh, developer documents that talk about how you can design um, inclusive locomotion techniques, inclusive, um, you know, captioning systems, uh, as well as a video tutorial that walks through those to those concepts uh, visually. Uh, so, you know, we use those and we of course uh, refer to so many of our colleagues internally on our uh, accessibility task force as um, kind of experts on this topic. Yeah, so plus one on all those <laughs> for me, this is mm -hmm. Roland. Um, uh, definitely um, very much looking into the VCAG 2.0 guidelines uh, from the web, understanding that um, web accessibility guidelines are focused around the content uh, itself, not actually about immersion. So there's a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, accessibility guidelines on the web are focused around consuming content versus uh, in the VR space or spatial experiences. There's a whole a big component that that is immersion and you lose that immersion if you strip the content out of the experience. So um, there's the Able Gamers uh, um, um, uh, uh, nonprofit organization that, that came up with a bunch of really good um, um, game guidelines uh, for, for accessibility. They're, they're very good uh, to, you know, um, and, and actually they are also referenced in, uh, in, in the XR access resources. So, yeah, I think that everything that's out there is basically accumulated in XR access. And for any kind of edge cases where I feel like uh, I want to play more and uh, build something, I usually um, uh, explore like the, the lowest common denominators of what's currently um, defined as an uh, as a accessible, and then build uh, prototypes and experiences to like uh, push the edge. So um, I encourage everyone to kind of see what's out there and test that, and also then go uh, beyond that and actually validate because you know um, in in a lot of cases. Uh, the theory is, is is different from the reality and it's really important to kind of always uh, keep a check on what's being like uh, um, like provided as the, the the standard so that's that's my take on that thank you very much um so i think we have time for one more question um this one comes from uh, actually a couple of people to ask this on slack uh, do you have any tips or thoughts on um, making uh, what's most important in making um, content creation and platforms like Unity uh, more accessible to people with disabilities? And do you have any tips on making that happen? Yes, yeah. my top tip at the very top of my list is get a, use, a test user group that has lived experience. You cannot get valid feedback. On, on what you're developing unless you put the right people in this situation to give you those feedback. So um, definitely reach out to, to those in the community that are willing to offer that feedback. And you're in a great spot as an audience member, XR Access is, is here for that. So first and foremost, test with, with, with individuals with lived experience, so you can get the best form of feedback that helps promote that content and that immersion as Roland was saying. 
And I'd like to add to that, um, definitely creating educational resources as well. Uh, for me, when I was a young developer, I lived off of YouTube <laughs> videos and walkthroughs mm-hmm. from other developers who were trying to figure out, you know, difficult problems and and having those kinds of uh, resources available for me uh, and really easily accessible online was something that um, I think is super helpful. So, you know, if you do include features to make your, your game engine more accessible, um, create resources around it, teach people how to use it and, you know, mm-hmm. begin a a dialogue, I think, with your community about how to use those things. Yeah, um, this is Roland. Uh, so one of the big parts of the WebXR space and everything that's uh, surrounding the platforms of the WebXR device API, uh, everything is living on GitHub, everything is open source. There's tons of uh, projects and experiments out there. And there's a lot of um, uh, like uh, projects that people can um, contribute to and, and build in accessibility um, uh, features. And this is a like um, this is a open source uh, kind of uh, shared experience. Um, Unity itself has also plugins, and and everything mm-hmm. at the moment that is focused mostly on accessibility are plugins, uh, and they're not really built into the systems quite yet. But I think that the best way to to approach this is to see what's out there, test with people uh, that have uh, actually those disabilities and uh, needs. You know, not only mm-hmm. try to uh, do the color filters uh, and uh, um, see if if uh, um, if you can still walk through the experience. Obviously, this is important. You need to validate for yourself if you understand the content based on those filters or like muting or whatever. But the, the, you have to understand that uh, you, uh, as an able-bodied person, you cannot really uh, simulate uh, how a person with a certain disability can can uh, um, interact with the software because the senses that are missing in that person are um, like are the, the other senses are picking up over 150, 200 percent of the capabilities and make up for that kind of missing part. So therefore, uh, like it's it's good to double check yourself, but you always have to actually test with a person that has those needs and, and, and understand how they are used to interacting with content. And therefore then you can make a really truly inclusive and focused um, experience for, for everyone. One last thing that I would like to add to that, um, look at the researchers in your community as well. A lot of researchers are building uh, plugins. For example, uh, Yuhang Zhao is a researcher at Microsoft and Cornell Tech. And in 2019 at the XR Access Symposium, she um, delivered her research on contrast shaders, which is a plugin that you can add into your experience. And it blew my mind that this this plugin was accessible and I put it into some of our experiences and it was beautiful. So I think the, the fact that we are here having this conversation is a great step in the right direction to continue to collaborate, continue to look at the, the work that's coming out of the research and the work that's coming out of groups like these. Um, I think these are all great tips, but don't forget that we, we always have to build with accessibility at the forefront, not as an afterthought. So if you, if you have a, a takeaway from any of this, when you go back to your teams, whenever you go back to your work, um, make sure to cultivate that, that same attitude of, of building for all, because whenever we build features that benefit all, Everyone wins. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashley, Andrew, and uh, Mari, uh, and Roland and Sophia, even though uh, some of you could not be here. Um, So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, Now we'll move into our next plenary panel, uh, Realizing Inclusive Value, moderated by Liz Hyman.